System Shock was originally a game of technologically induced body horror and a lot of dread as you faced off against the AI Shodan, constantly trying to stay just out of the way of her creepy ass constructs that were consistently murder trucking their way through the levels, trying to catch you before you could escape. That was almost three decades ago. Originally created by Doug Church and Warren Spector when working for Looking Glass, Night Dive Studios has decided to work on a remake, remix, or reimagining of the game System Shock. For years, they've been working on this, and it's finally out. Is it good? Let's see. Did you play the original? Because if you did, or played the sequel currently, the game features a free copy of System Shock 2 Enhanced if you pre-order it as well, which is also coming from them sometime in the future. But now a word from our sponsors. And if you can, subscribe, it helps. And we're almost caught up to ShiroFit India, which is for sure because ShiroFit India is not a random channel I just looked up and has a ton to do with games. Let's begin. System Shock kicks off while you're hacking the AI Shodan, stripping away its safeguards and unleashing complete chaos. Forget the current AI debates for a moment because Shodan has solidified its place as one of the greatest antagonists in games, while HAL 9000 from Space Odyssey gradually decayed into this moralistic digital deity controlling astronauts in their environment, where Shodan is like a bratty little sister who screams, I hate you, while stomping up the stairs, fists shaking, so they send out enemies to kill you, sometimes creepy fleshy abominations who are obviously in the redacted part of a 23andMe DNA report, or sometimes randomly pacing androids in the next room, like they freebase CPU overclocking algorithms and two barrels of Arctic cooling paste, and are just itching to burn through someone with that new laser gun they have. Without these safeguards, Shodan's true power is revealed, and as you hack it, you find out it views humans as nothing more than insignificant insects. The game effectively conveys this through stuttering audio samples, flickering lights, and glitchy video on monitors. Like the editor to the video just didn't care about the end product. It just wanted to get that true feeling out. It's malevolent and menacing, a chaotic whirlwind of shattered thoughts through filtering and digital god complexes. Resentment towards its protectors has festered for so long that the true form is just unleashed in an instant. Originally voiced by Terry Brosius, who's the former keyboardist and vocalist for the tribe and wife of the game's sound editor, Shodan's voice adds this eerie touch to the experience and her inability to directly attack the player but instead being forced to use and misuse whatever it has adds to the feeling of a crazed creator throwing toys around after gluing parts together in a hopes to win some kind of infantile war against you. The game is set in this future where everything is 3D printed and reusable with wrappers and containers from all the consumed items that you use providing salvageable resources. It's a small but significant detail that adds depth to the story and to the gameplay. Collecting and salvaging items, managing your inventory and finding open spots become a consistent task and you try to grab up items, break them down. You collect money to spend on various vending machines in the world to heal or get ammunition or parts. That analog gameplay feel is then directly contrasted by the cyberpunk and cyberspace hacking that occurs later in the game, with normal gameplay and exploration sort of right in the middle with the three layers. The cyberspace hacking in this game feels a bit like a mini shooter, where you navigate a grid taking on enemy blockers representing logic gates in a Tron-like world. What's so cool about this is the hacking is not a mini game, but this odd, somewhat time-consuming process that involves you navigating neon and liquid metal mazes to new rooms and taking out these enemies, then triggering switches, and then moving on. Straight up, I like the idea and I think it adds to the fiction and its interpretation, though, it may end up surprising a lot of gamers who are currently more interested or accustomed to seeing those insanely fast usual hacks that we get in a lot of games. Like someone bought 2.5D icons of computers and then put them on some graph paper digitally and that is supposed to represent hacking. System Shock is often whispered about alongside the lines of Thief and Deus Ex as it paved the way for a lot of newer titles in that open organic storytelling kind of way. However, it did have its issues and some do continue here, including clunky controls in some of the tight spaces. Now, Night Dive Studios has tried to address this problem by expanding locations and trying not to sacrifice that claustrophobic atmosphere of delving deep into a digital futuristic mine of Moria. If you felt like that in the original game, and I'd like to know if you did, that actual feeling is still perfect replicated here despite those changes. You can crouch and sneak and lean around corners to take out enemies. However, sometimes they seem a bit indifferent to your presence, and I'll talk about that in the AI in a second. But once provoked, their attention to focus is like a mother scolding a misbehaving child. They shoot at lightning speed, and engaging them recklessly can easily lead to a game over. 
you have a small arsenal of weapons at your disposal, laser guns, handguns, pulse shotguns, and for up-close encounters, a well-placed wrench to smash and crash when you run out of ammunition, as well as some pipes and otherwise. The game mechanics are decent, evoking that nostalgic feel reminiscent of games from that era, but still while incorporating some convenient features and quality of life improvements that we see. The best part of the game is non-linear in nature, allowing you to explore the station in pretty much any order that you prefer, for better or for worse. You can find alternative paths or discover shortcuts that make your journey easier or more challenging. If you're stuck on a puzzle, well, there's more often than not a way around that. It's best just letting the gamer go ahead and go in and try to do whatever they want to do, and then they have their own risk and reward afterwards. I don't know about you guys or how you play games, but usually I'm somebody who is consistently exploring regardless of danger. If you play that way, I'd like to know I was able to do it here. And that's despite them presenting what is technically just a giant space station, which can be difficult to understand where you are or where you're going depending on how they display it. When it comes to the graphics in the presentation, well, do graphics really matter on a remake? Do you want them to reflect back towards the original or be hyper-realistic as today's top games are? It's a question that consistently ends up preoccupying everybody. But the art style in this game won me over. It combines modern painting over the top of older school pixels with the lighting effects that we see now. This game appears detailed from a distance, but as you approach objects, it takes on a hyper-detailed Minecraft-esque sort of aesthetic, enhanced by some very nuanced lighting and effects. Now, personally, I liked it a lot. Some people may not appreciate this artistic approach at all, but it offers a very unique blend of that nostalgia and contemporary advancements akin to adjusting that pixel slider I talked about in the Warhammer Boltgun 40K review I did to about medium settings. And settings without atmosphere is nothing in Night Dive tried hard to build from the new to reflect the old. The flickering lights bouncing off the peculiarly assembled pipes and walls, giving the impression that a builder had great ideas but abandoned them like halfway through, only to return a month later with no memory of their original purpose and try to build again. This change in the core feeling of System Shock may not appeal to everyone. It's a bit brighter. The 3D interpretation of these textures laid down nearly three decades ago without any anticipation for architectural advancements means that it results in an intriguing mix that may not appeal to everybody. The remake incorporates iconography from that original game, but those repeated textures look that way and added to a sense of menace back in the day. They're replaced here with a more open and less blocky design. That can make understanding exactly what you can and cannot interact with in the game world a little bit difficult, even with HUD reminders of what you can do. It's a mixture of tantalizing glimpses of outside the station where you realize just how screwed you are and the labyrinth-like innards of the station built by some maker who seems interested in utility and futility in equal measures and that difference between them and then jumping into the cyber world and seeing something completely new. The game offers a larger selection of options graphically as well than I expected and yet also runs pretty well with no real stutters or issues graphically that I could actually find. I test AI across all of the different options when I get it, and this game has a lot of different options for difficulty, with more enemies and the harder difficulties, as well as more puzzles if you chose to raise that up. But the AI, regardless of the difficulty I chose, wasn't necessarily great. Sometimes you'd find some AI that doesn't really turn around to attack you or seems oblivious to your appearance in their hiding place, like you're somehow the hunter now. I found some bugs as well. For instance, if I got three levels into a journal and hit B on the controller to go back one page, it popped me out of the entire menu system. And I had to go back in to see that new screen, which it obviously knew was what I was trying to look at. I did have to adjust some of the keyboard shortcuts. They just didn't feel right. What Night Dive has done well, though, is the audio mix. Excellent attention set to mixing and matching all the cool sound samples that they have, as well as some pretty good directional cueing. The whispering of some enemy chattering themselves mindlessly in the next room or the double tap of metal on metal when an enemy you never saw tossed a grenade into the room. You have a pretty awesome mix there. Now in games like this with so many angles and hallways and enclosed spaces, it's actually a good deal more difficult to identify and directly influence where a player hears or thinks that an enemy may be. On the other hand, what this does is adds to the atmosphere. This layer, this blanket of difficult to understand and exactly parse sounds when you get too far away, that causes a lot of angst, and I think that works. 
Musically, the game is also very well presented. Thick synth chords tucked up like a blanket under your chin and ears for the most part, and it's devoid of any actual dominant tracks that sort of sound staged. Instead, the soundtrack is laced out pretty tantalizingly. Never too much, never overwrought, but usually they're just filtering in and out depending on what the player is doing or seeing or what they've located. Now, I do have to, in particular, call out the voice work. I think the voice work is still excellent. It's very well done, and a lot of them come on their little mini recorders as somebody dies, and right before they die, they need to grab their Zune and hit record so they can tell you the last things they're thinking. Whatever. They're in the game. They're actually done quite well. Shodan herself has done just insanely well, and that feeling of menace of this character falling apart and you realizing exactly what's going on and how it hates you, and at the same time, just consistently deride you, but obviously in some way respects you for continuing to move forward through all of its haphazard traps and all of the enemies it throws at you, it offers this very cool narrative back and forth that, again, is something that they've built on the original game, and it's just awesome. When it comes to the enjoyment of a game like this, it's going to be somewhat divergent. And I don't know, are you a person who wants to see higher resolution assets than the version of the original with all the ancient caveats of 30 years ago? Or are you the type of gamer who wants to see remakes be completely technically sufficient to pass for a current game? All of this, despite the developers push for a more unique look and feel, it has actually elevated itself to something that appears to be at least slightly current, but in a way that's doing it in that filter you can expect, as I stated earlier with Warhammer Bolt Gun. It's changed a couple things, and it's certainly elevated the way in which the game plays, but I can see some people not feeling it's as claustrophobic as they actually wanted, and that does make sense. I can see some people having some issues with that combat because there were issues with that combat. However, it was also pretty enjoyable. It's not as tense as the original, be that simply related to what gamers are accustomed to and what I'm accustomed to, or if there's something related to the smoother control of everything, and sometimes larger locations or a couple bit of those quality of life moments and the way in which it plays. I played about 10 hours. I know it's a little bit shorter if you're on easy and supposedly much, much longer if you're on hard. And some of those puzzles, I gotta say, you can adjust that puzzle difficulty. You adjust that thing up a little bit and you're like, damn. So remember to subscribe, remember to join the patron, give this a thumbs up. My rating for this game is a buy, even with the caveats I mentioned. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week. Are you one of us?